Good morning and welcome to our morning service here at Heath. We're so glad to see so many of you here and others joining us online. We pray that all of us will be able to have a sweet fellowship in what we're about to hear. Our preacher this morning is our own pastor, Reverend Wynne Hughes. We trust him in prayer that he will bring to us God's word mightily and not just him, but also we commit our hearts that we will be ready to receive them um, in the right way too, that we will uh, prepare the right uh, soil for the message. Um, you have received the notices, um, but just um, to clarify a few things, we do have half term, therefore some things um, are changing or actually not taking place. Uh, therefore music and movement on Tuesday um, or toddlers on Thursday, they won't be taking place um, this week due to half term. And uh, Friday Night Live also will not be on or the other kids' clubs on Friday. So please do have that in mind. We will, however, have chill and chat on Tuesday, 7.30 in the hall. Um, so maybe that might give you an opportunity to have a Tuesday free from other activities. And remember the aim being to invite other people um, to hear the gospel. So if you have friends um, that you think they will benefit from it, please feel free to bring them. It's a very informal way of introducing them to the gospel, and many have found it really, really helpful. Other things to you um, uh, for notices, EGM taking place on 21st of February at 7 p.m. Um, there will be an after meeting um, following the evening service tonight where uh, Dr. Andy Christofidis and Dr. Nathan Monday um, will be able to answer if you have any uh, further questions in regards to their calling uh, to this church. So that's this evening. Um, other than that, some requests, uh, essentials for homeless people in hospital. So if you've got items that would be um, able to be used, please see Carwin Shires about that. There's more details in regards to how to contact him um, on the online version of the notices. Um, also, on Wednesday during prayer meeting, we heard how uh, students within Cardiff, they will be having their mission week next week. Um, so they do request our prayer, uh, but they do request some practical um, uh, things too. So um, in regards to the two universities, that's Cardiff Met and Cardiff uh, University, there's a request for lasagna or pasta bake. So if you are able to provide um, help in any of these areas, please see Beth and Owens or Johanna Cosby. If you don't know who they are, please come and see me and I can uh, direct you to them. Um, do remember, continue to remember in prayer, um, the reunion for uh, seniors camp, which is taking place um, as we speak, and also the reunion for a junior camp, which will take place here um, in the church premises next weekend. Uh, we do not take offerings during our services, but if you'd like to give to the work of the Lord or towards the missionary fund, uh, you can do so either online on the church website or through the offering boxes found in the porch. Thank you. And praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant. Do you enjoy praising the Lord? It is pleasant, and praise is comely. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem, that's the church, and he gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. He healeth the broken in hearts and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. So let us sing his praises. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 113.
Let us now hear more from the Word of God. Our reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to read the first parts of the chapter. 1 Corinthians 15. Let us hear the Word of God. <clears throat> Moreover, brethren... I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, and then by the Twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, vain, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. And then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now, aren't you glad of the but nows? But now Christ is risen from the dead. And he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. May God bless that reading and hearing of his word to us. Uh, boys and girls, I've got uh, these sticks to show you. They're not mine. Um, Mrs. Cross, is it okay if I say that? She has very kindly lent me these. Now, if you fall and are injured, uh, you, if you're going to recover will need uh, these sticks to be able to lean on and they don't, they don't fit me, I'm afraid, <laughs> and walk properly. Now, uh, I sometimes sprain my ankle. How many of you have, have you twisted your ankle at all? When you get to my age, you even sprain your ankle in your sleep. <laughs> and it's difficult, isn't it then? When you have injured yourself, it's difficult to walk properly, and you need something to lean on. Now, in our reading, 
we heard that our first father, Adam, fell. And in Adam, and we are all in Adam, uh, just like uh, whales when they play rugby, we are all in the team, as it were. When they lose, we all lose, don't we? So when Adam fell, disobeyed God, we all fell. And we can't get ourselves better. We can't even get ourselves up. And what God has provided, what Jesus Christ is, is he's like these crutches. We depend completely on Jesus Christ to save us. And when we are believing in Jesus Christ, we keep on depending on him every day. Just like uh, Mrs. Cross has to depend on these sticks. What a lovely picture of believing in Jesus Christ. It's to just lean completely on him. And it's not one stick. Uh, it's not leaning half on Jesus and then trying my own strength on the other. It's leaning completely on him. Have you come to completely depend on Jesus Christ? And if you have, are you still depending completely on him? The Bible says if you think you stand, then you are about to fall. So, we're going to sing now a hymn about what happened uh, in paradise in Eden. Sad indeed that day. My countless blessings fled away. My crown fell in disgrace. But that's not the end of the story. But on victorious Calvary, Christ won that crown again for me, and my life shall all be praised. It's a tricky tune, but it's a Welsh tune, so it's a good one. Number 542. Let's now bow our heads together, seek God's face in prayer. Father in heaven, it is a pleasant thing for us to sing thy praises 
Uh, we remember a time when these hymns didn't mean anything to us, but we praise thee, O God, uh, for uh, opening our eyes. Uh, Lord, uh, I was blind, but now I see. And we just praise thee uh, that we have seen and we do see uh, the glory of thy face in Jesus Christ. And we do praise thee, O God, uh, for that name. Uh, there is a name we love to hear. We love to sing its worth. And we just praise thee, Father, for the note of victory that has already been sounded in this service. Even though in the midst of life we are in death, O Lord our God, we thank thee that death is not the end, that Jesus Christ has conquered death and brought life and immortality to light in his gospel. We praise thee that we do have a gospel good news to declare that after uh, so many decades, this is still an evangelical church, and it is only because of thy keeping that we are still standing. And we just want to give thee thanks this morning, O Lord our God. And we thank thee that this is the Lord's Day, it is Resurrection Sunday, and we thank thee for a beautiful morning, but we thank thee more than that uh, for the Son of Righteousness rising with healing in his wings. We thank thee for those lovely promises that we have already read of in thy word, that thou art a God who heals the brokenhearted, who binds our wounds. And we pray, O oh God, if there are any in here this morning who have uh, come in uh, with broken uh, spirits, uh, with uh, uh, wounds, wounds maybe uh, which can't be seen, but those uh, wounds of the heart uh, which are even more painful uh, than any physical uh, wounds. Oh Lord, we do pray according to that promise uh, that they would know uh, that sense of well-being. Uh, Father in heaven, we know that uh, even uh, when sorrows like sea billows roll, uh, thou hast taught us as thy children to say, whatever our lot, it is well with our souls. Lord, we praise thee for Jesus Christ, uh, for the balm of Gilead, for the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on that cross. Though two had wounds, there conquered only one, and Jesus is his name. Father, we praise thee uh, that he hath trod the serpent down, uh, that one day the devil will be thrown eternally into the lake of fire. And we thank thee, O God, that even now he is bound, and we're praying, O God, in Jesus' name, that thou will bind Satan. Uh, he seems to be very active in uh, this land at the moment. And we're praying, O God, that Jesus Christ uh, will march uh, once again in great power. Onward march, we do ask, uh, almighty Jesus, gird thee on thy mighty sword. Uh, we pray uh, that uh, territory that the devil has uh, had a foothold uh, over will be not just regained by thee, but uh, that the kingdom of God uh, will leap in uh, great uh, uh, bounds, O oh Lord. Uh, we thank thee for uh, what thou art doing in some parts of the world. It amazes us, O oh God, in uh, places like Moldova and India and Nepal, uh, that uh, there is uh, much uh, uh, spiritual conquest happening, uh, even in places that are very dark spiritually. And Lord, we do pray for um, John Orchard and Mervyn Neal, as they are over there now, uh, that they will be protected uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And for the men that we know of, in Andhra Pradesh especially, uh, we pray, O oh God, uh, that they would know uh, much blessing. O oh Lord our God, our cry is, while on others thou art blessing and calling, do not pass us by here in this little land of Wales. Lord, may we know those uh, times of refreshing once again. 
Lord, we thank thee for uh, the drops of mercy for the ones and twos that have come to believe. But Lord, may there be uh, families reunited at uh, the foot of the cross. Uh, may there be uh, those uh, who have gone away from thee, may they come back, O oh Lord. May there be a turning of the tide. Uh, we can't do that. But, O oh God, it's a comfort to us to realise when the tide has gone uh, out at its farthest, that then it is turning again to come back in. Lord, we long for such times, and we thank thee for a Lord's day. What an oasis in the desert. Bless it to us today. Lord, bless the camp reunion uh, in uh, Somerset. Bless James Allen as he brings the word there. We do thank thee for our camps and for the countless souls that have been uh, saved in uh, those uh, meetings. Uh, Lord, uh, bless uh, Nathan and Andy uh, as they share about thy call to this church this evening. Uh, bless uh, the seven uh, nominated elders as uh, we uh, meet again uh, in a week's time. Lord, lead for we dare not take a step unless thou show the way. Lord, don't allow us to be spiritually healthy in our own estimates. Lord, may we ever be weak in ourselves, but strong in Christ. Lord, forgive us for trying to do things in our own strength, uh, just as we believed solely on the Saviour's merits. May we continue to trust in thee. Lord, from the youngest to the oldest here, may we be a people who are utterly dependent on their God. Hear our cries. Be with uh, those who are laid aside. Uh, we think of uh, two elders in particular, Keith and Paul. They are very dear to us. Oh, Lord, put thy healing hand upon them. And for those who are grieving, so many amongst us, O oh, Father in heaven, draw near to them and comfort them, we pray. Hear our cries, because we are poor and needy, but we thank thee that this poor man cried unto the Lord, and he heard him and delivered him out of all his fears. Hear us then, because we're praying in that wonderful name, the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us, to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our next hymn is a Sankey, uh, so it's a good one. There is life for a look. That's another metaphor for faith. Not just leaning, it's looking. And there is life at the moment you look at the crucified one. 487.
encounters with Jesus in John's Gospel were in the Arab quarter in Jerusalem uh, by the sheep gates at the pool of Bethesda and Jesus Christ has done something astounding. He's healed a lame man but he's done it on the Sabbath day and the religious leaders are furious with him and from now on they are plotting to do away with him and we're going to spend a few Sunday mornings looking at the aftermath of this healing in John chapter 5 John chapter 5 we've already looked at one Jesus defends the Sabbath from the twisted religiosity of the scribes and the Pharisees but then more gloriously Jesus goes on to say some amazing things uh, from uh, the uh, criticism of the Pharisees you'll often find when the church is facing a conflict out of that comes uh, some of the most glorious statements that she has ever made our confessions of faith for example were done uh, because of conflict and the one we're going to look at this morning is John 5 verse 24 John 5 verse 24 this is Jesus speaking most assuredly I say to you he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death unto life what a wonderful statement especially since we've had so many funerals recently uh, we've had two funeral services over last weekend there is another one coming on Monday and you may wonder why as Christians we don't get discouraged with all of this now those who lose loved ones will be grieving and that is real and we all feel that sense of loss but a believer doesn't grieve as those without hope because we have a savior who says if you believe in me you've passed from death unto life do you know that hope now the new king james is very weak unfortunately at the start of verse 24 most assuredly that that really uh, doesn't get it right the old version says verily verily now that doesn't make much sense today does it but what it means is amen amen or to translate that truly truly Jesus is emphasizing here I'm telling you the truth all of the words of Jesus Christ are precious all the word of God is precious I've got the words of Jesus in red here but all of this is the word of God but some sayings of Jesus are more important than others and the one we're looking at this morning is such because Jesus himself says I'm telling you the truth now we've already come across another verily verily haven't we in John chapter 3 truly truly unless you're born again you cannot see the kingdom of heaven and look at what Jesus says here it's not just a double truly 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 I say to you there's a triple lock as it were on it if Jesus is saying amen amen and I'm saying it to you he wants you and me to listen right so all I want to do is ask this morning why do we have to pay attention to this more than some of the other sayings of Jesus Christ have you come to church just to be a spectator well Jesus says you are not 
to be sitting there passively. You are to listen as if your very life depended on it. Now let's look first at the words that Jesus uses. Uh, look at verse 24 if you've got a Bible. He talks about not just life, but everlasting life, eternal life, life forever. He talks about death, and he talks about life. So the word life is used twice, the word death is used once. Uh, Bill Shankly said football is not just a matter of life and death, it's more important. Jesus isn't just talking about life and death, he's talking about eternal death, eternal life. Moses said, I have set before you this day eternal death, eternal life. That's what we're thinking of. I don't know whether that voice is saying uh, eternal life or eternal death, but this voice is. What is death? What is death? Death is not the end. Death is separation. So what Jesus Christ is saying here, do you notice the tense? Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Is he talking of the future? No, he's not. He's speaking in the present tense. So what Jesus is saying here is that we're already dead. Have you noticed uh, the end of the verse? Passed from death to life. That's what becoming a Christian is. What a strange way of speaking. Passed from death to life? No, Lord, you've got it wrong. We are alive now, and we're going from life to death, aren't we? No. That's why Christian funerals are victorious occasions. We're already dead. And what Jesus Christ is offering is a passage from death to life because death is separation and we're all spiritually dead because as I was trying to say to the children in Eden in paradise our parents were alive they were uh, joined as it were uh, to God spiritually they walked with God in the cool of the day in the garden but then sin came in disobedience to God entered the world and death and the Hebrew is emphatic we're dealing with certainties here this morning God said to our first parents if you disobey me dying you shall surely die and that moment they were separated from God death is separation spiritually they were dead God cast them out of paradise and ever since that day we are in the east of Eden and there's no way back to paradise. There are two flaming swords blocking the way. So Jesus is saying you must listen to me because you're spiritually dead now. We're separated from the life of God. And one day, and this is what happens when we die in the normal sense of the word, there is a physical death where our souls, uh, this spirit part of me, are separated from our bodies. Our bodies go to the grave, whether they're cremated or buried, it doesn't matter. They <laughs> are going to decay or be burnt to ashes. But our souls go on forever. And one day, there's going to be a second death. But we're not interested in that this morning. So Jesus is saying, you listen to this because you are dead. And you need life. Now, you may say, isn't it unfair 
that because our first parents fell, that we all fell with them? Uh, what did uh, the reading say? As by man came death, in Adam all of us died. Isn't that unfair, you say? Well, Adam was our representative, just as the Welsh rugby team, right? Uh, we say, uh, we, did we win or lose last Saturday? We lost, did we? Yeah, we, we lost. I wasn't playing. You weren't playing. But we still say, we lost. Well, those of you who are Welsh will say that. <laughs> Because the team is representing us. So if the team wins, we win. If the team loses, we lose. And how much did we lose? About two points. But we still lost. We still lost. And James says, even if we keep the whole law of God, and if we fail in one point, we still lose. This is why this is so important. God's pass mark, to use the, another illustration, to get to heaven is 100%. It doesn't matter if you get 99% right. You're still lost. And dead is dead, isn't it? You, you're either dead or alive. Even a person who is in a coma is still alive. And where there's life, there's hope. But once a person has died, that's it. A funeral director may dress up a dead body, but they're still dead. And you and me, when we're born into this world, we're spiritually dead. Uh, somebody asked George Whitfield, one of the greatest preachers this country has ever seen, 18th century George Whitfield preached on the verse in John 3, you must be born again, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And somebody asked him, Mr. Whitfield, why, why do you always preach on you must be born again? Do you know what Whitfield answered? Because you must be born again. <laughs> there, there isn't another answer. And then there's another word that Jesus uses. He doesn't just talk about death and life. Eternal death. Eternal life. He talks about judgment. Condemnation. Believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. So that means we're under judgment. Not only are we spiritually dead, but we're under judgment when we're born into this world. I sometimes enjoy uh, going jogging in the Lower Wye Valley. Have you ever been to Pierce Field? Uh, it's uh, one example of the picturesque. And there's an old mansion uh, in Pierce Field Park near Chepstow. And it looks beautiful, but it's ruined. It's ruined. You can see something of the former glories, but it's in ruins. And not only is it ruined, that's a bit like us. The image of God, which our first parents had in paradise, is still seen in us. But we're ruined by the fall. But you can't even enter. When I was a boy, you could go inside Piercefield Manor, but you can't now. Not today with the health and safety regulations. It's condemned. It's a condemned building. And not only are we ruined, we're condemned. Condemned. We're appointed once to die physically. We're already spiritually dead. One day there'll be physical death. And after that, the judgment. And if you're not in Christ, if you're still in the first Adam, you will go on to the second death. This is vitally important. I wish I could plead with you. I've been reading about uh, the Romanovs, the last Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, and the disaster that befell them uh, when uh, the revolution occurred in 1917, I think. 
And there was a British ambassador in St. Petersburg at the time called George Buchanan, and he was a gentleman. And he was seeing the Tsar for the last time, I think. And he tried, <laughs> an ambassador is only supposed to give the message of the Queen, it was Queen Victoria. No, it wasn't Queen Victoria. Uh, whoever was in power in this country. But George Buchanan didn't just want to be pleasant with his art. He wanted to warn him about the catastrophe that happened. And this is how he spoke. I think this is important in terms of what we are facing, a worse catastrophe if we don't believe in Jesus Christ. An ambassador, I am well aware, has no right to hold the language which I have held to your majesty. And I had to take my courage in both hands before speaking as I have done. But if I were to see a friend walking through a forest on a dark night along a path which I knew ended in a precipice, a cliff, would it not be my duty, sire, to warn him of his danger? And is it not equally my duty to warn your majesty of the abyss that lies ahead of you? The abyss. I'm an ambassador, but I haven't come from uh, the court uh, of uh, the king uh, or the queen of England, but uh, I'm the ambassador of Christ. And I wish I could, as the Apostle Paul did in 2 Corinthians, uh, beseech you, be reconciled to God, because there's an abyss ahead of you. It's not just life and death, but eternal death. Don't you want to be saved from that abyss? So that, that's the first reason we're dealing here with spiritual death, even eternal death. Secondly, how, how can I be saved? How can I be saved? Listen to Jesus Christ. Truly, truly, I say to you, do you want to be saved? There were lots of conflicting advice to Tsar Nicholas II. And I don't know if they could say truly, truly. But Jesus says, I'm telling you the truth. Hear my word. He who hears my word. There's hearing and hearing, isn't there? Have you, have you ever flown? Some of us have been flying so many times. Uh, you know the parts uh, before the the plane uh, takes off when they go through what to do if uh, there was an emergency? What, what, what do you do? I, I, I'm just still reading my book. I've heard them so often, the instructions of what to do if we have to uh, do an emergency landing. I'm, I'm not really listening. I'm sort of, but I'm more interested in my book. How many people come to church and they're treating uh, the instructions here uh, from God himself like the instructions given at the start of a flight. Are you just here, but you're not really listening? Well, Jesus is saying, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word. We hear as if our very life depends on it because it does. He that has ears, says Jesus on another occasion. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And it's not just hear, is it? What does he say? Believes. But notice how he puts it. He who hears my word and believes it. No. Believes in him who sent me. So Jesus doesn't just want us to believe the record true that we've got here but he wants you to believe into him it doesn't matter whether you believe in God believe in the Lord Jesus Christ it comes to the same thing I'm putting my trust in a person it's not great knowledge that will save you you need to know a minimum amount 
But all you need to know is that Jesus saves. And I'm going to trust in him. I don't know maybe how he's going to do it, but I'm going to trust in him. Are you? You can know and believe, as it were, in the facts of justification by faith. That great doctrine. But that's not the same as believing in Jesus Christ. I know of people who have very little Bible knowledge, but they're believers because they've cast themselves on the Lord. Are you going to do that this morning? And if you have believed in him, are you going to carry on doing that? Because I know of nothing more precious. You see, the religious leaders, they, they, they were offended at the fact that Jesus Christ had come into the world to save sinners. Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by, that Jesus should die? That's not to believe in him. What is it to believe? It's to love the fact that Jesus is the friend of sinners. What is it to believe? It's to look unto him uh, that was crucified on that cross, not for his own sins, but for yours and mine. What is it to believe? It's to embrace Jesus Christ. He's the lover of our souls. What a title. Isn't it amazing that Jesus Christ here is addressing the Pharisees, the people who are plotting to kill him, and he says to them, whoever believes in me, even if you believe in me, you will be saved. Oh, how the grace of God amazes us. The first sermon that was preached under the auspices of the church most of the people in that congregation were Jerusalem sinners. They were people who weeks before had cried out, crucify him. And such is the grace of God that instead of judging those people, God is offering them salvation. Now there is a limit to God's patience because in AD 70 there did come judgment. But God is still offering you and I salvation. It's still a day of grace it's faith you see that's the dividing line uh, we're, we're a diverse congregation here this morning aren't we uh, we're uh, male and female obviously uh, we're Welsh and non-Welsh uh, we are old some of you young and a number of us in between uh, we, some of us have degrees, some even have doctorates. I am surrounded by two doctors. Some don't have degrees. Uh, some are outgoing, some are inward looking. But none of those things are the dividing lines. The dividing line is those who believe and those who don't believe. Are you a believer or an unbeliever? Uh, listen to J.C. Ryle. He puts it like this. We should mark carefully the strong language of Scripture in dividing uh, between believers and unbelievers. Uh, it's not uh, um, those who are raised in a Christian home, those who are baptized, those who are church members, those who have done good, those who are active in the life of the church, those who are reverends, those who are doctors, it's whether you believe or don't believe. That's the division. Believe. Finally, how? What happens when I believe? You pass from death into life. I love that. I've been watching some of the old Doctor Who episodes. When I was growing up, Tom Baker was the definitive doctor, the man with the scarf. And there was one episode, I know this is in Star Trek, but in Doctor Who there was one episode where the doctor was teleported from the spaceship, not the TARDIS, from the spaceship he was on 
to this dangerous planet. Being teleported is instantly transported, right? I haven't experienced teleportation, but I have experienced what it is to be translated from death to life from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son, the kingdom of light. And, you know, with Doctor Who, he could be teleported back and forth. But listen, when God transports you or teleports you from the kingdom of this world where Adam is the representative into the kingdom of the second Adam, who is the last Adam, because he was victorious, you can't be teleported back. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. It's not something that's going to happen to us when we die. You know, we talk, don't we, in Christian funerals of being promoted uh, Sylvia and Marjorie and Margaret, they've all had their promotion. But they passed from death to life the moment they believed in Jesus. Uh, what did we sing? The first hymn? The vilest offender who truly believes. It's not great faith. It's not knowledgeable faith. But genuine faith. Trust in Christ who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. I'm no longer in the kingdom of darkness. I've been made alive. Uh, faith doesn't cause me to be born again, but faith is evidence that I'm born again. Just like evidence of physical life is a baby crying, evidence of spiritual life is a person crying, Jesus, save me. And the moment we are trusting in Jesus Christ, we are made alive and we're no longer condemned because he has taken the condemnation upon himself. <laughs> Faith. See the place and see the cross, the tree, where heaven's prince instead of me was nailed to bear my shame. Bruised was the dragon by the sun, though two had wounds, there conquered one, and Jesus was his name. This is what happened to the man at the pool of Bethesda. His healing was a sign of the spiritual healing that we experience when we believe in Jesus Christ. And he rejoiced. And he couldn't get over it. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, didn't get it. They just didn't get it. But this man, though he didn't know who Jesus was, he was rejoicing. Where are you this morning? Are you still not getting it? Come, believe, whoever you are. And if you are believers, show forth what Jesus Christ has done. And it's not just the length of life that's ahead of us. Eternal life means living forever. Uh, uh, we have a member who's 100 and, is it 101, our oldest member at the moment? 101 or 102? I can't remember. Now, wouldn't you like to live to 101? 101 is a drop in the ocean of eternity. God has put eternity in your heart. We are going to live forever. You're either going to be in eternal hell or eternal heaven. But the prospect of living forever. But this doesn't just talk about that. It talks about the quality of life. Eternal life is to know God. To know him. Just as Adam in paradise walked with God. So we, the moment we believe in Jesus Christ, the life of God has come into our souls and the Christian life now in the words of Tozer is the pursuit of God to walk with him and Jesus Christ, <laughs> he's real, you know, he's real. 
when you're going through darkness, even the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. How many of you here can say, he's real? He draws near to me, especially when I go through those dark places. We're going to sing in a minute the words of Wesley, no condemnation now, I dread. There is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus and all in him is mine. He's my captain now. I'm in that team, as it were, alive in him, my living head. No longer Adam, but the second Adam, alive in him, my living head, and clothed with righteousness divine. And listen, I'll close with this. When Jesus was victorious over death, over sin, over the devil, over hell on the cross, it wasn't two points. It wasn't two points. It was a rout. It was. Thanks be unto God who gives you and me the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You've either got faith to quote Bob Dylan, or you've got unbelief, and there ain't no neutral ground. Stop sitting on the fence. Come down and cast yourself on Jesus Christ for his name's sake. Let's sing together. I've already quoted from the hymn, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me? Yes, he died for you who caused his pain for me, him, death, pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? 524.
Father, we praise Thee for sending Thine only begotten Son to leave heaven and go not just down into this world, but into the abyss, uh, that He descended into hell, took the condemnation upon Himself for our sins, so that we might uh, not just be forgiven, but that we might be raised, uh, even heavenwards. And we just praise Thee that in Him uh, the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. May every one of us, O God, be in Him, not having our own righteousness, but that which is through faith in Christ. And now may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.